Uh, it's a generic test automation framework which basically means that you can use it to test anything. If you have a suitable uh, test library, but uh, no, it's not it's not like a GUI driver for like for example Selenium is for web testing or Swing for Swing app, uh, sorry Jemmy for Swing applications or something like that. It's a generic framework that you can use to test um, any kind of application. If you have a test library that utilizes one of those GUI drivers or a test library that communicates with the interface of that application directly. The framework is implemented uh, with Python, well, one of the reasons we are talking now here, and uh, runs also on Jython, Java implementation of Python, and uh, pretty well nowadays also on Iron Python, which is a .NET implementation of Python. You can extend the framework creating these test libraries with Python or Java, and also, if you really would like to, you could use some other languages using XML RPC based language uh, interface. But I think in here, most people would be probably happy with just Python. Open source, Apache 2 license, which is really pretty liberal license. You can do whatever you want with it. Sponsored, the development is sponsored by Nokia Siemens Networks, used within NSN also very, very actively. I think there are over 1,000 users worldwide. And, um, the community also outside NSN is pretty active and uh, growing all the time. Also, and uh, we've been getting a lot of contributions, not that many for the core framework, but uh, plugins and uh, stuff, stuff like that that uh, make the ecosystem richer. Posted on Google code, but that's actually probably going to change in the somewhat near future. We all remove some of the project, sub project to GitHub, which seems to offer mm -hmm. better services for collaboration. Well, not topic of this talk too much. Yeah, go. We try to go to demos as soon as possible, basically. And uh, this is maybe the last slide we show. And um, it's the high level architecture of the framework. In here is the system of the test. What, of course, the uh, most important box in the, in the diagram. That's what you're going to ship, uh, what, you, what you try to ship, and try to make ready. Here you have some test data, which can be in plain text format, like we are going to use today, but it could also be HTML format, HTML tables. But anyway, the, it has some kind of syntax that the framework understands. It can read the files, uh, understand what, the te what test cases they contain, and then utilize test libraries via test library interface. And those test libraries are then interacting with the system under test via test tools, like Selenium, for example, or directly. This architecture means that regardless the system of the test that you have here, you always create your test cases in, in a uniform way. There's always the same high-level syntax for creating test cases. And um, also that you can create generic test libraries that you can use regardless uh, what kind of system. So there can be a generic test library, for example, for web testing, which you can use regardless of, web, of the web application you are actually are testing. Let's go for the demo then. Okay. We are going to show in this uh, first demo, we, well, this, this is kind of ad hoc presentation now. Uh, we might may have time to show another demo, but uh, we are at least going to in the beginning to show a demo that is doing uh, is a web testing. But please remember, this is not web testing framework only. Can you get? I'll try to just let's see. Mirror the display; it's easier for me. Okay. So here. System of the test. It's just a login screen, basically. Um, if Janne types something invalid there and clicks login or whatever, he doesn't get in. Oops. What happened now? Oh, it's. Switch monitor somehow. Obviously, I did. Okay. 
happy now. Yes. Uh, yeah, now. Yeah. And then if I if I happen to know the correct credentials, I will get logged in. And this is all the content of this application. So what a fancy thing it is. Great. <coughs> so we try to create some test case for that, both for the valid login, for the happy path, and also for the invalid, invalid login. And uh, Yannick can start here and create the first directory. And I will put those test cases. These test cases will be in plain text form. And uh, you can just write them to some file. And he's, of course, using Veeam here. If you want to get uh, some good Veeam hints from Yanni, you can go, you can go to talk with him afterwards. But uh, you could use any other text editor. Yeah? Could you make the font a bit bigger? I can try. Let's see. Is this big enough? Still quite small. Right? Oh, can you read it? On the back? Just yeah. enough. That's enough. Well, okay. I can I can increase it one point. I think I have width here. So, of course, you can use any text editor for editing these files. If you are using HTML format, you could use any HTML editor. Uh, but there's also a separate test data editor for robot framework test data syntax, which we'll probably show briefly at some point. But we'll start with these plain text files. So in here, you can write your test cases in more or less uh, natural language and, uh, under that kind of a special header. This is the name for the test case. And then below that comes the basically the test sequence. If there are people here who are familiar with a uh, Ruby tool called Cucumber, it's kind of a similar thing that you are doing here. It's a typo, by the way. Not. Mm -hmm. If not. That would work. Um, it's kind of similar. In Cucumber, you are using always this uh, behavior driven or even when then <laughs> format, which would work also with robot. We probably can also show that. I promise to show quite a lot, so <laughs> we have half an hour, so maybe we can. Um, but here, this is a keyword-driven approach. Um, you probably want to have a concrete username and password. There. So that's a sequence. First, open the login page, then input username, submit credentials, and login page should be open. And these are kind of macros that we are calling is second and third they take argument so they could be reused with some different username and different password also in other test cases. Now that we have the test case done, we can execute it. And, um, mm, well, I can actually use this one at this point. It fails. No surprises there. There's a uh, Nothing to hook up this test case with our application, but um, at least we still get well, we can show the report. Yeah. So we got a report, and um, it shows that we had one test case failed because there was no keyword open login page. If you go click that, we got a log file which has more information. Well, in this case, it doesn't really have much more information, but that's the only thing that happened basically. We'll see more of that when we get a bit further. So we need to start implementing those so-called keywords. We could have all those keywords implemented in uh, test libraries, so that, that could be implemented in Python. So we could have a basically Python method open logging page somewhere. But um, this framework also makes it possible that we can have these keywords here in text format and just make them, just utilize lower level keywords. So we could write this, for example, like this. Open browser, that URL. And then, well, it could actually contain the title should be or something like that. Um, 
So now we are utilizing some other keywords. And uh, this keyword actually happened to be from a test library that is all already available called Selenium Library, which Jan and I takes into use here. So that's, that library is not automatically available. Well, you first of all need to install it, but then you also need to take into use here in the test data. And now the keywords provided by Selenium Library are there. And those keywords are, of course, somehow web testing related, like open browser, clicking links, verifying title, whatever. And now, running the same thing. The Selenium Library now automatically started, or we started um, Selenium server, Selenium RC basically, so that we are communicating with the Selenium tool. And uh, well, it still failed, but for different reasons. But just for the demonstration purposes, just put some <coughs> adding sleeps in test cases, generally bad idea, but for demonstration purposes, it works fine. Usually. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Not this time. time. Okay. I guess I have Sometimes it takes. Yeah, for the cell and Mars, it can take some time, a little time to start up. Okay. So we got browser open. Actually, two windows because one is from the Selenium tool, but we can ignore it for for the moment. You can now show the log file. That looks different. So now we have one passing keyword there, open login page. If these keywords would have failed, we would then see here stack traces and so on, so that we could understand what was what happened. Now we can implement the next keyword. This one is a bit special because it needs to take arguments, so we need some more syntax. But th there is, uh, again, a suitable keyword in a Selenium library that you can use. So now we are creating basically a macro that takes an argument. This, uh, in this case, it will be the demo, fast pair. It is assigned to that variable there. So there's a, in this syntax here, we have variables. And then we pass that value to another keyword. So as you can see, this is a programming but very high level, although we probably all like, like that in Python that it's very simple programming language, it's still, this is still easier. So this, this kind of programming, of, well, programming is meant for uh, testers or people who don't have any programming experience. But because it's so easy to switch from here to Python or Java, it's also not so big a deal to write this, this, uh, this kind of test cases even if you were able to write this stuff in real programming language too. Cool. So it looks like white space is significant here. Yeah, in this format, yes. So there's a var there are various uh, test data formats. And this is the, in this plaintiff's format, white, two or more white spaces is basically, um, I think you could use just the simple text. Yeah, so in, in here, two or more spaces between these is, uh, means that this are kind of in a separate cell. In HTML format, we actually have the presentation still open. Yeah, this is a kind of similar test case table in HTML format, and there you have actual tables with columns. In the plain text format, column separator is two or more spaces. Good thing about plain text format compared to this one is that it's, it's easier in version control system. You get more meaningful tips when you want to change something because with HTML you can change a lot of uh, HTML source code, so it's hard to see what was the actual meaningful part. With this is easier, but of course, you by 
easily can also get problems by not having enough spaces or something <coughs> like that. Does that format allow mixing spaces and tabs? Uh, yeah. Because if it does, that's it, as if it's a world of birds. Well, in in a way it does. It considers tab as a space also. Okay. So yeah, if you have a single tab, then it's a single space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah sorry, actually it's converted. I think that I, I, I think actually think that tabs are converted to four spaces before. Yeah, it's so probably so that tab is internally converted to two spaces. Okay. But you should never mix yeah. tabs and you spaces. Should, <laughs> you should, you is, if you want to, there is actually TSV format also, where you then must use tab with every as a separator. That's uh, that's slightly easier to automatically automatically generate if you need it to do something like that, because in here you need to take care of escaping in some situations. But don't, don't um, what, what kind of ready-made uh, macro libraries are there for uh, complicated deployment? Probably not much, but we have a library for SSH, so, yeah. so yeah. you can... You can I mean, one, one of the problems we've been uh, trying to tackle is uh, the fact that in order to set up our system, we need to install number of RPMs to a certain number of test machines in the rack and then start uh, edit some config files using curl <laughs> and then start up the servers, wait for the servers to start up, then run the test case. It would be great if this could be somehow made less painful. It, it could be, but this curl in your case would require a custom test library. Yeah. I happen to know that they use robot framework to some extent at least in VMware. Mm. And they use that for step and set that up there. I don't know how they released anything, anything there, but I know they have done something that, that you can set, start virtual machines and whatever. Yes, yeah, so they are testing Linux distribution installs at OpenSUSE, I think. I saw an article at lwn.net. Mm. So they want to make sure that uh, so when the package changes, you can still install mm. and like start a web browser. And, and they do start up virtual machines. But they can show the... <coughs> custom libraries and stuff like that we, uh, as soon as we are done with this simple demo which is actually getting ready well that's <coughs> okay I just killed it okay. no matter mm, well let's let's leave it like this let's see what happens if we get this far So, now you can say that. So test case failed for probably a proper reason. So we can see that we got already quite far. Oh, it, the selling library takes a screenshot automatically when things fail. So, the problem was this time in a test data, the test case, and the title, actual title was welcome page. Uh, this constant string here could be made a global variable, but I don't I think we are fine with that in this simple example now. Sweet success. Yes. So now all the givers are passing. This case is green, and if you got report. So it has green background. If you have to be color colorblind, you can customize this color so that you can use <laughs> blue and red, or uh, whatever you actually want, not green and red, because that otherwise it's not so good. But yeah, here we have kind of an um, indicator that everything seems to be fine. We could probably run the all the test cases from the demo. You have them there somewhere. Yeah, this. If you were using the front demo thing, No, they aren't, because I removed them. Um, the system under test that Yanni showed here, or we showed, is part of the demonstration for Selenium library. And um, if you go to robotframework.org, you can then 
from there, find Selenium library and from there demo. You can download it and uh, assume that you have Strobot framework and Selenium installed, you can run the same thing. You can start up this uh, very cool uh, login page thing and run those tests. And um, can you show the test cases first? So, perhaps this will be on. In the demo, if you just get them and run them, run those test cases. This kind of a test case, which looks very much what we just did live, except that it has tear down, which is a um, separate uh, special thing so that that key word specified marked as bit tear down is executed also if the test case fails. Otherwise, the test execution. Uh, ends well at least by default it ends uh, when the keyword fails. But this one it is executed regardless of the status, so the browser is currently to be closed. Um, so, but well, otherwise it's more or less what you saw. And then there's another test suite, this test case files create test suites, where we are testing the invalid login, and we have actually six separate test cases: one for invalid username, one for invalid password. So one well you can read yourself if the font is big enough. And uh, not those don't specify the workflow like the earlier one. It have, the first one has steps. These just have data. But this is specified that all these test cases use template. Logging with invalid credentials should fail. It is also just a keyword defined here. And basically what will happen that all those test cases end up using this keyword with these arguments. And so that's how we get six separate test cases. Testing all these kind of different combinations. You know what would be great if uh, Bing could actually highlight which words are keywords and which are just preformed strings? Well, Bing can obviously do that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering why didn't you have syntax highlighting? Actually, well, I just recently installed everything from the operating system up. And yeah, there's the actually, plugins. there's a but We actually do have a contributed BIM highlighting plugin. For some reason, I haven't had installed it to this machine yet. Yeah, there's a contributed BIM plugin and also a Tmux plugin. So if there happens to be Emacs people here, you also <laughs> get served. And also TextMate if there are Mac people. That was actually done by one guy in our team, not, not anyone who was not, not us, but anyway, so there's uh, some highlighters also. Um, but now I think we can take a look at the report. Now, now there were, in this case, there were some more test cases. They were organized in a directory, and Yannick just executed a directory which contains those files, and that means that this high directory that was named login test is kind of a top level test suite that contains all those test cases. So that there was one file valid login, another file invalid login that contained those test cases. So all this is very easy, of course, to put into version control system because it's just files and directories, nothing else yet. You get statistics uh, by test suite. Test cases could have tags, free labels that you can use however you want, and then you could get also the statistics by tags automatically. And if you then want to see, uh, for example, all all test cases belong in this suite. We click there, and it then selects in this widget here, and uh, you can sort these test cases. Well, that's not very interesting now, but you get um, overview, and clicking the name there always takes you then to the log file where you can see more information, which, well, isn't very interesting when everything passes. There you go. Once we have time, 10 minutes at least. Yeah. Plenty. Plenty. Ah. Should we show the how the Selenium library is implemented? I, I think we should show some Python code. <laughs> <laughs> Any can you show how to like implement your own plugin? So, for example, we have a uh, pretty custom software which you cannot interact via any kind of GUI. So, how would you? Uh, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Mm. Let's see if I have something on my file system. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good mother of them. So, I can No? This one. But we could also create something from scratch. I mean, hello world. 
Well, I can do that too. Yeah. Also, person while he's writing it down. Uh, what do you think is the like a sweet spot for this framework? For example, if you have a huge code base with numerous Java projects and hundreds of JUnit tests, so should you implement this at like tester level, level or in the should developers start using only this or how would you? Um, well, first of all, this is um, this is um, asset testing tool. So don't use it for unit testing. Use yeah. unit testing. Uh, tools for that. For anything, for well, customer acceptance testing, this is of course better than unit testing tools. Yeah. They're on integration model testing level, depending on kind of on your context, which is better. Uh, I would say that sweet for for this that where you have team that where you have both developers and testers, people and, and testers don't have much programming skills. Yeah. If you would have testers, uh, sorry, it's developers only that have that are doing everything, then you might be able to use just code, you can create your test cases in code because that's even more flexible. Everybody can do that, you can use your normal IDEs and so on. But that's not so easy if you don't know how to program. Uh, another thing is that if you have a customer representative that you want to communicate with these test cases, that's, that's not very easy if you show them that your Python code, that okay, here's our test case. But this, what, what you saw, can be shown to the customers, that okay, this is our test case and they can understand. So that's, a, that's another. So even if you were only developers, then that could be a still a reason to create at least some test cases using this kind of tool. And um, um, so that's those are the those are the kind of places where they probably work. And another thing is that if you have yeah, so well, how to convert this? Should you use robot framework with with Selenium library for testing web application, or should you use just Selenium? It depends partly on do you want to create your test case using Python code, or do you want to use the syntax? But also, if you have other APIs there, so say you have a database also, and a command line path or whatever, for all those, you could take custom, uh, ready-made libraries to robot and use just keywords from those. So there's a database library that you can connect there. With Selenium, if you, if, well, if you use Python, of course, you could do that. But if you were using, for example, Selenium IDE to record your web tests, you cannot easily add database functional to your test cases. But because the framework is totally decoupled from the interfaces, you can easily mix and match different libraries. And uh, so it's, I think the really, really sweet spot is uh, multi-interface, large product where you have testers who don't know how to program. Yeah. But it's not like it's, that's the only way, way it yeah. works. But that's kind of the way it's used at NSN, that kind of environment, and it works pretty well. So it's more like a new like ship a new cool module, you have to, okay, these are now the new keywords you, you can test on. Yeah, so. it would be great that if, it would also be a very, very, very good if in the team you have developers and testers working together. If you only have testers trying to automate stuff, that doesn't work so well because you still need to write libraries for your new, new functionality. And uh, developers, testers collaborating with everything there. It's a, that's, that, that's kind of the best setup. There was another question. Yeah, you mentioned that these test cases are so clear that the non-technical people and clients and such can understand them. Um, do you have uh, actual examples of this? Actual clients reading your test cases and understanding them? Because I've heard this several times that claim that they, they are understandable by lay people. Yeah. Do you have real first-hand experience of this? Well, yeah, but unfortunately, nothing very public because those are in real projects that are. Mm -hmm. So, but it does. It does actually work. There's a because you can use as clear language as you want. That, that earlier ones they were still slightly technical. There was those keywords and arguments. Could you show the example, the slides again, if you still happen to have them? Go a bit further. So you can also write this kind of language where you have actual just sentences. And then I think the end, the how you how to understand is that you should actually be creating these high-level specifications together, not so that you just create them and show them to the customers that do you understand, but it should be that this is the that um, you have a session where you are talking about requirements 
that's actually the asset and district development thing. We were also trying to fit in here. Um, Not gonna happen. So yeah. Specifically, <laughs> have you done this? Yes, we have. Yes, in, we have. Inside NSM, we have held workshops where also the uh, business people are participating, and we discuss the new features, and we write down these kind of examples in that session. Okay. We have done it. Yeah. Of course, it varies depending on the domain. At NSM, there are highly technical business people also who have no problems understanding programming. They are there. They have been programmers before, but there are also other kinds of business people there. So most of our hands-on experience comes comes from there. And of course, <laughs> there are varying levels of success. Yeah. It always depends on the people. So, but it can be done. Mm, just for for the, <coughs> I made an incredibly complex application. Yeah, it's nearly as complex. <laughs> it's more complex than the login page. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, just to demonstrate how to write the custom test library. So, <coughs> here we go. Uh, we have a class that is is some kind of public API to the application, and uh, well. We can then write a test library, uh, which uh, imports the application, and then just does whatever it needs to do with the API provided yeah. by the application. Or you can have, of course, you can because this is just Python code. There's no restrictions. Uh, this is also a valid uh, robot framework test library, and actually, you could also use this. In this case, this application could be used as a robot framework test library directly too, because uh, uh, there's no inheritance dependency to the framework code anywhere. When you write your own test libraries, they are completely independent of the robot framework itself. So uh, anything that is a class can basically be used. Also, a module can be used as a test library. So, and uh, just the example of using this. Uh, test library. Uh, all I need to do is to tell Robot Framework to take a library with this name into use. Uh, of course, during the runtime, I have to have the class on my Python path for this to work properly. And then uh, the rules are such that every uh, method of the test library that doesn't start with an underscore uh, is considered a keyword. And uh, Robot Framework does this uh, space and case normalization when it and then underscore. and underscore normalization when it tries to find the keywords. So basically, in here you end up calling the method yeah. that was defined there. And there's no no other infrastructure needed. If that method passes, the keyword passes. If it fails for any exception, fails. So that's the so that's how you see no fa failure in a keyword. If you want to return something from the keyword so that it could be assigned a variable and used later, well, you use return statement as well. And uh, if you wanted to print uh, something to log file, you can just write it to standard output and it will be written there. But there's also a logging API if you want to do, do something more fancy and don't want to use uh, that kind of, it's kind of a ugly to have print statement all over your library. Or if you want to use a real API, you can do that. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Single, sing, single, single double quote is quite OK. Basically, by raising an exception, either in the library or, or if the application code raises an exception, it causes this case to fail. So this is kind of a simple static static API. There's also another way to create libraries, which is more dynamic, suitable if your libraries grow probably really big, but this is what you need in more simple cases. And also, well, if I take a look at the resulting log file, in this, this case, when I added also the print statement, uh, yes. uh, the print statements from the log file. Oh, for, for, from the library RC here in the log file, so these can be held basically in the debugging. 
failures. Any more questions? How does this integrate with uh, tools like Boost Control and Hudson? Oh, um, well, that's a very good question. Yeah. <laughs> so first of all, as you see, Yanne was starting everything from the command line. So there's a command line interface, which means that you can start it with anything. Just use kind of a, all the all those CI tools and everything have a common. plugin to run something from the system. You can do that. Mm -hmm. But for Hudson or more specifically Jenkins, there's a plugin. For cruise control, I don't think there is, but uh, for Jenkins, there's a plugin that. Uh, uh, makes it more, more convenient and it shows you results better and so on. If I can get my yeah, internet working. If I can get some kind of internet working there. It seems to me that the conference <laughs> will be long. Could I see a 3G? Let's see if my 3G is working here. Yeah, so that's a, yeah, but it, it's a good question, but yeah, because it's a, you run it from the uh, common line, you can run it with anything pretty easily. But for Jenkins, there's a plugin, and also there's a plugin for Bitten, which is a continuous integration plugin itself for Truck, which, which somebody here might not be just a Python based thing. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of. Oh, well, there's actually plugins for Ant and Maven too, so those. Um, one thing is that in addition to those HTML files, you get XML file that has all the information of the execution. Actually, those HTML files are created based on the XML, so they have everything that you can see on those log files. And so you can then easily get more information from there. That's one thing that the Jenkins plugin does, it reads more stuff from, from the XML files. The return value you get from the console is uh, the number of failed test cases. So from that, you can al already know that was the overall steps okay, but if you want any more information, you need to go to the XML and parse it. You want to see. But it integrates more well. For some reason, my internet refuses to work here. This building has bad karma. I think I'm taking all of the internet into the stream. <laughs> We're also in Turbo's largest Faraday cage anyway. Because the, uh, mm -hmm. the exterior of the building is. My internet works from here. Well, I have 3G yeah. for a while. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah. Anyway, more questions? But I think we have to answer questions without them in, in the web. You can show this one here. There's the button on the. Uh, are there any kind of helper it's the plugins for REST this one. Uh, web services or...? There actually is two. Okay. We don't know which one to use because we haven't tried them, but it was pretty interesting. Yes. That <laughs> <laughs> that now we have... That's, it. That's, <laughs> that's impressive. It also integrates with <laughs> Now, actually, you could try for the fun. You could actually try... Uh, in the latest release, what we did was that those log files and reports can grow really, really big and we were able to make them smaller, uh, <laughs> uh, smaller in size and also we're able to make them work better so that actually in our assessment test case study, this is now the well, Jenkins this plugin. So we get the uh, test case trends in similar ways that you can get from JUnit or such test cases here. <laughs> My pointing device. <laughs> and, then, and then also you get links to the uh, report files. <laughs> so, so that's basically what the uh, plugin does. Not, not, not very much, but... We have something like 2,300 or whatever test cases for the framework itself. And assuming that the 3G works, it might at some point show <laughs> I, I'm not going to... You have those fat fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, you pressed wrong. <laughs> you need to press this one. That's it. <laughs> 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 it is not perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a... Uh, as you can see, the report can be opened to... Happen. But yeah, so there are two for the RESTful web services. There's a, the, in GitHub there are two. Okay, so now, and uh, I don't know what what are the main differences. Yeah. There are plenty of libraries for our framework out there, and uh, 
we are really, really help, uh, grateful if, if you end up using the framework, do something that is somehow generic and useful, set up a project in GitHub or Google God or wherever, and make it public, because that makes the ecosystem more uh, uh, richer and richer, and that helps everybody. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Uh, we have an extra uh, 15 minutes break now.